Hello. Welcome to the video sample of my presentation on the topic of personal finance. I really enjoy giving this presentation live, and one of the main reasons is because it applies to everyone. We all make decisions regarding personal finance, and by that I mean decisions regarding saving, spending, and financing our purchases. And in fact, it's oftentimes more important than the investment decisions that we make. For example, if you're investing and you want to go from an 8% return to a 12% return without taking on significant risk, that can be very difficult to do. But if you're looking at personal finance, you can oftentimes take a credit card bill interest rate from 20% to 10% by asking for a lower rate, changing cards, and if you pay off your balance, you can take that to zero. So oftentimes there's more bang for your buck on the personal finance than there is in the investment presentation. And as a result of that, this actually grew out of a preface to my investment presentation. As a result, it oftentimes works well in a conjunction with my investment presentation and also my sales tactics explained presentation, because there we also do some deconstructing of some sales pitches, which we're going to do here in personal finance as well. I also like the fact that this is relevant to a variety of audiences. It can be given to professional associations, such as doctors and lawyers, or family reunions, or even business professionals who might understand some of these concepts on an intuitive level because of their business experience, but I still can usually come up with a tip or two that'll be helpful to them as well. So let's take a look at some of the examples that we have here. I'm going to give you three right now for this sample. I wanted to start out with an example on financing decisions. And my premise here is that we oftentimes neglect to do the math and realize how much we're paying, how much we're sacrificing when we make purchasing and financing decisions. The example I use here is, let's say I offered you a choice. I'll give you $100 today or $101 in one month. And let's say that I'm a pretty reliable source. You consider that a pretty low risk proposition. Most people would opt for the $100 today because it seems like a, a good deal. You're only getting a dollar, which is a small unit in dollar terms and as, percentage, and as a percentage of 100. But the point is, it's only over a period of one month. So if you were to annualize that, you would actually, by going from $100 today to 101 in a month, you would be getting a 12% return on that investment. And by sacrificing that, you're essentially paying 12% interest. I put an asterisk there because technically there would, it would be more than that on an annual basis because it would compound, but let's, let's keep the math simple. So this 101 in a one month is actually a much better deal. You're going to have a hard time getting a 12% return on your investment over a year period um, without any significant risk. And here's some of the businesses that benefit from that. The one I want to illustrate right now is the Payday Loan Center. This is oftentimes how they make their living. They will charge you a low dollar denominated fee, but, as, but because their loans tend to be short term, it's actually a very high interest rate. In fact, 12% would be a pretty low interest rate for a Payday Loan Center. It also illustrates how we as human beings tend to think short term, we'll value the here and now versus the deferred gratification. And we also tend to focus on the payments. So if, it's, uh, if we're financing a significant purchase and it can be put, you know, a $2,000 TV, we can pay $80, $100 a month for, we tend to buy it without oftentimes focusing on the interest rate. And even where they offer free interest, there are a lot of snags that I can illustrate in my extended presentation. Finally, because we don't oftentimes do this math, it's not technically that hard to do, but we oftentimes gloss over it because we get so excited by the proposition that we will defer to relationships instead of the math. And by that I mean if we have a salesperson that we particularly enjoy dealing with, or if we're doing, a business, doing business with a local business that we think is a part of our community, we will trust them, we will value that relationship more than the math, and that will have us making a lot of bad decisions. There are a lot of people who are very friendly who will use that faith to take advantage of you in the mathematics department and charge you really high rates. Next, let's take a look at an example from the automobiles. Uh, purchasing an automobile is one of the most expensive purchases you usually make in your life. Some people say it's second only to your housing. I always like to point out that even though those are the most expensive material purchases most people make, if you really think about it in, in terms of purchasing as an investment, you also have to purchase a retirement. You also have to uh, purchase your education. And if you want to think about it this way, you are also purchasing your children since they are something that you're going to have to invest in. So in reality, even a house might be fourth or fifth on your list of most expensive things in your life. But let's, let's save that argument for the live presentation and get into my automobile example, which is where I compare leasing versus buying. If you think of your payments 
as a withdrawal from your checking account, I have those represented here by down arrow. So each of these would be a monthly payment. Now typically you'll do a multi-year uh, purchase financing, so there'd be a lot more of these, but I'm keeping these abbreviated for the sake of simplicity. But you'll notice a lease, you're only paying for the portion of the vehicle that you're consuming over the, over the term of the lease. Let's say you have a three-year lease, you're only paying for three years of that vehicle. Whereas when you purchase, you buy the entire asset itself. So oftentimes a lease ends up being less expensive on a monthly payment basis. However, you are neglecting something there. When you purchase this vehicle, at the end you end up with the asset itself, which has a value. You can sell it for that value, or you can just continue to use that vehicle and ha take that monthly payment that you would otherwise be spending on a new vehicle and put it in something more valuable to you like a retirement savings. So oftentimes, the mistake people make is they look just at that payment and say, oh, the lease payment is better, that's a better deal, when in fact, this might outweigh the incremental increase in your payment and it might be much better off with a buy. That depends somewhat on the interest rate. But I think that car dealers have become very savvy about this. Oftentimes when you ask what the interest rate on a lease is, they'll say, we don't even think of it in terms of interest rate, it's based on a factor. Uh, technically that's correct, but I believe that they've done that deliberately to conceal what the interest rate is in this sort of scenario here. They don't really want you focusing on that. They want you to think about low payments and a great car. Because for a lease, they can oftentimes put you in the same car for less, or they can put you in more car for the same, and sometimes they can even sneak a higher interest rate in. So even if you're making a smaller payment, it might still be more profitable for them because of the way these relationships and in, in, in payments tr turn out. I also wanted to point out another possible problem with the lease, and that is if you think of leasing a new car for three years, there is something called the depreciation curve, and that is how the value of the vehicle changes over time. And typically when you buy a vehicle, immediately there is a drop in value because you have to, uh, it's no longer a new vehicle. Even though you haven't put a mile on it, it's now used. And so there's an immediate drop in value, and then there's a curve. And this curve tends to level out with time. So if you think about it, the drop that you have between new and year one is much more significant than the drop it'll have between year nine and year 10. And I think you understand that intuitively. But the problem is if you're leasing vehicles and you keep, uh, every time you're done with the lease, you lease a new vehicle, you are in, if you look at the third year here, this is the drop in value over the first three years. It's usually 40 to 60% of a vehicle. And so you are living constantly on the most expensive part of the depreciation curve, which means you're, you're really getting a worse financial deal. If you, as soon as you get to year three, you buy another one, you go back to the top and you continually live on the most expensive period. Whereas if you purchase a vehicle, you, you will have to absorb that loss, but then if you keep it past the three year mark, you will then have these smaller increase, smaller decreases in value, and so the total per year decrease in value will be less with a purchase. And if you want to be particularly frugal, you can be like my father. He will purchase a three-year-old vehicle with low miles and in good condition. Those are still pretty reliable nowadays. And he will pay this level right here, and he will keep it till year six or seven and sell it at that level there before it starts to really become a reliability problem. So he, and then at the end of the six or seven, he'll buy another three-year-old vehicle. So my father will literally live on the least expensive part of the depreciation curve. And so that's some of the economics of purchasing a vehicle. Now let's take a quick look at an example from housing. And for my example here, I talk about a typical sales pitch that you get from a real estate agent. I've heard several of them say this to me, since the seller pays the agent's fees, let's use an example of a 6% real estate agent fee, if the seller is paying the fee, and that's true, the seller does usually pay it, the buyer then doesn't care because they're not paying it. That's not actually correct, and I wanna show you the mathematics of why that is. Let's say you're purchasing a $100,000 house. That's not particularly fancy these days, but it, uh, let's keep the math simple. The seller will receive $94,000 because they're having to pay the agent 6,000. But you might say, well, if I'm the buyer, what do I care? I, it's a $100,000 house. Ah, but what you're missing here is that this is essentially saying the seller is willing to part with that house for $94,000 because they're willing to do that here and that's all they're getting for it. So if you were an aggressive buyer and you could work without an agent, you could actually buy it for $94,000. Or if you're particularly fair-minded, you could say to the seller, hey, how about we split the difference and do it for $97,000. So the $6,000 commission gets split between $3,000 less in price for the buyer and $3,000 more in value for the seller. You're essentially splitting the commission that way. 
And that's, that's an illustration. I have several uh, parts of uh, real estate lore that are technically incorrect that I point out in my presentation. This is just one example. It's also important to note that this is a common tactic in general in terms of sales pitches. I call it the half truth, meaning the first part of it, the seller pays the agent, that's actually true. But the conclusion that they draw from it isn't actually supported by that truth. And so they kind of make a switcheroo here. They go from something that's true to something that's not, hoping that the thing that you know and recognize as true will cast such a halo over the entire statement, including the conclusion, that you won't realize it's not actually correct. So those are some examples from my personal finance presentation. I hope you've enjoyed this, and I'm, I'm willing to give this to you and your organization. Just contact me per, for a proposal, and I look forward to doing business with you.